The year is 1346. European ports are preparing to receive shipments from merchant galleys that have travelled from elsewhere in the continent and from other nations such as China and the Middle East. Genghis Khan now controls most of Asia from China to the edge of the Black Sea. Conflicts between Christianity and Islam across these continents have eased and the Silk Road is now safer than ever. There has never been such a good opportunity for trade and economic prosperity since the days of the Roman Empire. However, with trade ships and caravans passing between continents, more is being transported over these long-haul distances than just cargo. Along the trading posts of Europe, word is spreading of an aggressive disease to the Far East. This unknown epidemic is said to be spreading throughout India and China, as well as Western Asian regions, and piles of corpses are said to be lining the streets of the stricken areas. Merchants in Europe fear such an illness reaching their shores, but commerce triumphs over caution and things continue as normal. They were right to fear these rumours, however, and when this devastating pandemic did finally reach Europe, the resulting death toll was unimaginable. Over the next decade, this disease, better known today as the Black Death, killed millions of people in Europe, Asia, the Middle East and North Africa, and the plague remains arguably the worst historic epidemic of all time and is an uneasy reminder of just how vulnerable we are to sickness and disease. The plague, in all of its forms, has some common symptoms, with all variants of the disease invariably resulting in death. Initial symptoms are reminiscent of influenza. Sufferers may exhibit pains, chills, fevers, cold sweats and diarrhoea, among other things. The next phase of the disease, which is more typical of the Black Death, is to attack the lymph nodes. These nodes are part of the body's immune system, and so if left untreated, the plague can move into the blood and lungs, causing two other variants with equally fatal consequences for the victim. When the infection has sufficiently infected the lymph nodes, they can swell up and turn into large black lumps, named buboes, which ooze bodily fluids and can poison the victim. Should they survive this, more extreme symptoms will begin. Seizures, vomiting, bleeding, shock, extreme weakness, respiratory problems and gangrene. The end result of all of this, in most cases, is death. With medical knowledge at the time so limited, and most medical practices based off of religious ones, the people of Christian Europe would have been like sitting ducks for such a deadly and contagious disease. The outbreak of the plague in the 1300s was known at the time as the Great Pestilence. Ever since the 1800s, however, it has been more commonly referred to as the Black Death, and it is actually considered the second major outbreak of such a disease in recorded history. The first outbreak came between 541 and 750 AD, when a plague known as the Plague of Justinian spread from Egypt to the Mediterranean and throughout northwest Europe. This plague, while lesser known, is believed to have been almost as deadly, killing anywhere between 15-25% to of the world's population, an estimated body count at the time in the range of 25-50 to 50 million people. However, the Black Death was a separate strain of the same microbe responsible for the disease and is not believed to be a direct result of this forgotten disaster. It was another form of the plague, caused by the same bacteria, which decimated Europe 600 years later. That being said, its devastation was witnessed, recorded and understood throughout China and parts of Asia, and this might have played a role in the spreading of the second wave of the disease. The plague did not emerge in Europe. Just as the Justinian plague had, the Black Death is thought to have emerged in Central Asia many years before, and natural climate change allowed rodents and other disease-carrying animals to migrate to less deserted and more populated areas. The Mongol conquest of China in the century before resulted in trading and farming falling, and a number of natural disasters had damaged the population and food supplies across the continent, leading to a weaker and more susceptible population. The Black Death is thought to have arrived soon after widespread famine began in 1331, meaning it killed over 25 million people in Asia some 15 years before it arrived in Europe. The disease spread through Asia thanks to the Silk Road and other such trade routes, and it is thought to have been transported via rats, gerbils and other rodents which were carrying fleas that hosted the bacteria responsible. Most ships were infested with rodents back then, and transportation across seas allowed for the disease to pick up pace as it moved towards Europe. In 1347, the plague reached ports in Sicily, and when it did, the disease began accelerating even faster across this new, untapped continent of potential victims. We do not know for certain from which route the plague reached Sicily, but the believed first entry may have been via the peninsula of Crimea due to conflict, 
when the Mongol army attempted to take over the trading post city of Kaffa. As mentioned before, a previous plague had ravaged Asia, and so its severity was very much known. In other words, Asian soldiers knew that this disease would debilitate and ultimately kill sufferers relatively quickly. It may have been for this reason that the Mongol army, who had brought the disease with them among their ranks, began catapulting their infected dead into the city walls. This was not the first recorded use of the plague as a bioweapon, but it certainly had the most disastrous repercussions. When the bodies were flung inside the walls, traders from the former state of Genoa, who owned the city at the time, began to flee. They set sail in 12 galleys for Sicily, which is where the first well-known instance of the disease was reported in Europe. In October of 1347, 12 ships docked in Sicily, but by this point most of the crew had perished and the rest were infected with buboes and were clearly a hazard. The port forced the galley ships to leave, but it was already too late. The plague had unwittingly been transmitted to the people who expelled the ships, and the Black Death was now in Europe. Sicily fell quickly, as the small contained island was engulfed by the disease. The exiled galleys then headed to Venice three months later, and a few weeks went by before a major outbreak in the city of Pisa began the disease in northern Italy. The Italian army expelled the galleys once again, and these ships are reported to have docked in Marseille soon after initiating yet another entry point into Europe. With so many points of entry, the disease spread aggressively throughout Italy and France and quickly broke into Spain and Portugal. By mid-year 1348, the disease was now spreading east and northwards through Germany and into Scandinavia. This resulted in an eventual spread into Norway and the plague was so strong that it managed to survive on ships bound for Iceland. Iceland, of course, would have been extremely susceptible to continental diseases given its isolation from the rest of mainland Europe, and so Iceland also fell to the epidemic. As the plague spread overseas through galleys and merchant ships, it managed to find its way towards the British Isles. As you might expect, it first began on the southern coasts, but worked its way up to London, and from there spread north towards Scotland, simultaneously alongside its northward passage through Scandinavia. Trade routes were now transcontinental canals of the disease, and so more isolated parts of Europe were actually able to avoid the disease. Parts of Belgium and the Netherlands managed to dodge the rest of Europe's grim fate, as was most of the Basque country between France and Spain. However, the Middle East did not have such luck. The plague shifted through Eurasia, and Russia had been hit with the disease along the southern border, before spreading down to Alexandria in Egypt. While the disease didn't tear through the African continent the same way it had done to Europe, partly owing to its proximity and remoteness to the Sahara Desert, it worked its way back up from Egypt and infected Gaza, Lebanon, Syria and Palestine. While mostly fatal for humans, the plague was also capable of infecting animals, and livestock levels fell as a result of the disease. In many cases, refugees had headed for the less populated areas of the countryside, and this further contributed to the spreading among livestock damaging food and material supplies. Continental shortages of meat and wool ensued. As for the more populated areas, carcasses were building up in the streets and in large plague pits in most countries, remaining there for weeks just because there were no longer enough healthy people to clean up the dead. In some parts of France, entire rural villages were wiped out, and these settlements were not discovered again until the First World War some 550 years later. Eventually, the situation got so bad that doctors and priests closed their doors to the infected, as sufferers were left to die with no other forms of help or assistance. It would have felt as if God had truly abandoned them. Overall, Europe's death toll is believed to have been between 50 to 70 million people, so around a third of its inhabitants, but some argue that the actual portion of the continent that fell to the disease could have been closer to 60% of its inhabitants. Many towns and cities were wiped out, and some major cities lost between 80 to 90% of their residents. England was said to have been left barren of life, and significant depopulation was also reported in Asia, causing body pileups, mass graves, and ghost towns right across the continent. Globally, around 155 to 200 million people are expected to have died, possibly equating to around half the world's population at the time. So the plague genuinely was like a real-life Thanos snap, it is believed that the world population took 200 years to recover, and the disease continued to reoccur in and outside of Europe right up until the 1800s. It was a truly terrifying nightmare to the helpless civilians, who could not risk even as much as skin-on-skin -skin contact for fear of a painful, undignified death. I imagine most of those victims' final thoughts would have been to wonder how in God's name such a disease had managed to cause so much damage.
All strains of the disease, commonly referred to as plague, are caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis, also known as Y. pestis. This bacteria can cause various types of the infection depending on where it strikes and the mutations of the organism. There are three main types of plague. The septicemic plague, an infection of the blood which causes clotting and blood poisoning and can be developed from other forms. The pneumonic plague, a severe lung infection. And finally, the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague was the main type of plague responsible for the Black Death and is the form which aggressively attacks the lymph nodes, forming buboes. However, other forms of the plague can be developed from the bubonic plague. For example, in late stage bubonic plague, pneumonic plague can be developed. As a lung disease, this then enables airborne transmission of the disease which would have made things much worse for the sufferer and would have increased contagiousness. While raging boils and flu-like symptoms are genuinely attributed to the bubonic plague, all three types can cause severe fevers, headaches and a loss of strength. The onset tends to occur between 1 and 7 days after infection and all three forms are life-threatening if left untreated. Y. pestis can be transmitted via droplets from coughing or sneezing, the way a common cold might be passed. Sexual contact and direct physical contact were also known to pass the disease and even indirect contact was risky too. The bacteria can also survive in soil as well as remaining airborne for extended periods. Food and water can also carry the disease, as can rodents and animals in all continents typically aside from Australia. This likely meant that reservoirs, both for humans and animals, would have been infected and would have spread the disease and increased death tolls untold amounts. This was an understood fact long before the Black Death however. As mentioned, when the Mongol army were attacking the city of Kaffa, they catapulted the bodies of their infected dead into the city in the hopes of contaminating its inhabitants and their supplies. There are also detailed historical records of the plague being used as a bioweapon in ancient China, when infected animal carcasses were thrown into enemy water supplies to poison entire legions. In some battles during the Second Imperial Dynasty of China, infected human carcasses were also catapulted into cities under attack. This grim practice was disturbingly common. Irrespective of intention, the plague has no problem spreading naturally as we know, and the main contributor for this is believed to be fleas. Large quantities of rats and gerbils inhabited Asian plains and trade routes, and their hosted fleas often looked for new hosts. In urban areas, there would have been no shortage of supply. The main flea believed to be responsible for the transmission of the plague is the Xenocylatiopis, otherwise known as the rat flea. However, some dispute that this flea was the culprit and point to a different type of flea that preferred humans as a host, given that direct physical contact seemed to be such a prevalent method of transmission. Whatever the case, it was some kind of flea, and if it was a mixture of the two then the plague would have had plenty of targets given the poor hygiene of humans back then and the commonality of rodents aboard trade ships and caravans. Trade ships had the edge over land transmission as they allowed for the disease to cross oceans, causing the plague to fast track to completely uninfected areas and begin spreading. Of course, at the time nobody would have known this, and furthermore most sufferers would not have shown any symptoms for a few days, so a person who appeared perfectly healthy could have infected dozens of people in a short period of time, but there was really no telling who you could trust. Animals were also hosts. Not just rats and gerbils, but cats, dogs, foxes, squirrels, birds, etc. They all carried the disease and acted as hosts for the fleas and bacteria. As well as the spread of the bubonic plague, some have suggested that a separate epidemic may have been complicating the issue. Documented cases of the plague did not always match the expected symptoms of the bubonic plague, but did record skin lesions with black centres which has led some to speculate that an outbreak of anthrax may have been occurring simultaneously. Plague pits in Scotland were examined as some of the bodies were indeed contaminated with anthrax spores. Anthrax causes boils and lesions which develop into ulcers, and these turn black and so could have been mistaken for the plague. These ulcers can cause a myriad of similar symptoms, but also toxemia, bacteria contaminating the blood. If this was the case, anthrax would have made people much sicker and would have likely increased mortality rates exponentially. According to historical records, anthrax mortality rates were as high as 92%. Counter arguments have been proposed and we don't know for sure what else could have been spreading, but any parallel pandemic would have added to the problems. As Y. pestis is a form of bacteria, it can be treated by something as simple as antibiotics. Of the 200 recorded cases each year in the present day, the best course of action is antibiotics and bed rest. 
One such type of antibiotic that can be used is tetracycline, which is commonly used to treat acne in teenagers. It's remarkable to think that medication we take for granted and use to treat something as simple as teenage spots could have saved hundreds of millions of people in days gone by. As with any disease, natural selection does allow for the more naturally resilient to prevail, and so now around 15% of Caucasians have some degree of biological resistance to the disease. As for humans with a naturally higher chance of infection, well, they can be vaccinated. Unfortunately, medical knowledge and treatment at the time was some way off what it is now, and many forms of treatment were gruesome and unsuccessful. One of the main pieces of advice given by doctors to families with suffering victims was to use smoke therapy. At the time, smoke was believed to have air purifying qualities, so infected victims would basically be hotboxed. In reality, this treatment would have likely caused some degree of carbon monoxide poisoning and would have worsened any respiratory difficulties sufferers of the pneumonic plague may have had. Other people took up smoking tobacco, believing it to have plague preventing qualities. As unpleasant as smoke therapy sounds, that is about as tame as treatments for the plague were. Bloodletting is an old medical practice whereby doctors cut open the veins of sufferers to release infected blood on the belief that the body needs the right balance of blood and other fluids, and too much blood led to the disease. This treatment would have severely weakened victims, on top of being extremely painful and degrading. If there was any hope of the patient surviving, bloodletting would have most likely sealed their fate. Another just as unpleasant and painful therapy, which had somewhat of a more honest aim, was lancing. Lancing is still used as a medical practice today, releasing infected blood and pus from ulcers. However, at the time, this was performed on the buboes of the sufferers, often using unclean tools. While the buboes would have killed the victims if left to build up, lancing often led to problems of its own, septic shock, blood poisoning and death. The only other methods of treatment fell to religious officials, with many believing that the plague was a curse and a punishment from God. Treatments were simply too immature at the time to do any good whatsoever, and would have contributed to the spreading of the disease and mortality of the victims. No one is certain of how the plague was stopped, but it certainly wasn't by some miraculous cure. The sad reality is that most of the infected victims died, and gradually populations became so sparse that transmissions became more difficult and the plague seemed to burn itself out. Basic quarantines for victims had been in effect, which would have contained the disease. While nearly all of these victims died, their isolation stopped the spread to healthy people. These healthy people would have, in turn, isolated themselves too. Uninfected households often remained sealed off, and the wealthy moved to much less densely populated areas. It is believed that winter in several of these countries would have helped somewhat by killing off swathes of rodents and fleas, but in reality this probably wasn't a significant contributing factor and weather conditions are often linked instead to the end of the last great outbreak in England in the 1600s. While hygiene wasn't greatly understood at the time, the general fear of infection did push hygiene standards up somewhat among the living. People attempted to wash more and took greater care of where they ate, drank, bathed and what they came into contact with. As for the masses of dead bodies piling up on the streets, well, most of these were cremated due to the sheer lack of grave space and people to bury them. This incineration also helped stop the transmission, as contaminated corpses were fried and their fleas and bacteria died with them. Plague numbers dropped in Europe, as did the population, as save for some outbreaks occurring over the next 500 years, the worst of the Great Plague had passed. While the worst outbreak of the plague in recorded history began and subsided in the 1300s, it is not the only instance of the disease. The plague continued in several separate outbreaks for well over half a millennium. Outbreaks hit England and Europe between the 1500s and 1700s primarily, but thanks to a more switched on society, measures were taken to limit the damage it caused. While most practices were largely ineffective, they managed to prevent every other outbreak from becoming a global disaster like before. From 1518 onwards, new laws were introduced in England to curb the number of disease transmissions. Infected households had to hang straw outside their house for 40 days, and should they have chosen to leave their houses, they were made to carry a white pole, rendering them social outcasts. Further regulation included a red cross being marked on infected houses, as well as the words, Lord have mercy upon us, which has become an iconic image of plague-ridden London. 
Mass burials now took place during the night and were signalled by the local authorities to give people time to stay away, and the slightly increased knowledge of the plague from previous outbreaks managed to stop these outbreaks from completely decimating the population like it had done 200 years prior. The worst of the plague in England before the final major outbreak occurred in 1563, when about a quarter of London's population is estimated to have perished by a spike in the disease. But the last and most historically famous outbreak in English history came just under 100 years later, in 1665. Once again, it had spread from Asia and the Middle East down trading routes, and this outbreak also owed its transmission to fleas and rodents aboard trade ships and caravans. The outbreak began in February, and by September a fifth of all Londoners had fallen, equating to a death tally of about 100,000 people. Many people fled the city for their own safety, and laws isolated infected people from society, causing the local economies to collapse. Many faced poverty and starvation, and were often forced to steal food and supplies from others. Sporting events, musical events and public theatre were all stopped during this period, and London was said to be a ghost town once again. At its peak, historical records taken by parishes show that as many as 7,000 people died in one week. This time, however, the weather was able to help stop the spread of the disease. The cold conditions towards the end of the year killed off most of the rats and subsequently the fleas, and transmission of the disease was curbed dramatically. Something else that assisted a year later was the Great Fire of London, which, while killing surprisingly few people, managed to kill off a lot of the infected rats and clear infected areas. The final reported case in London was in 1679, and the plague has not really affected England or the rest of Great Britain ever since. The final outbreak is often what is taught in English schools and in history classes, but is not actually recognised as the third of the three main waves of the plague in world history. That honour belongs to an outbreak that occurred much later and for much longer, between 1866 and the 1960s. Once again, the disease began in China, but India was the worst hit country. Of the 12 million people estimated to have died in this outbreak, over 10 million of the victims were in India alone. The disease remained active in Asia and parts of Europe until 1960, when its reported cases plummeted to below 200 a year thanks to the invention of the first bubonic plague vaccination by Sir Valdemir Hafkain. Hafkain was a bacteriologist from Russia who also helped to develop a vaccination against cholera. After this, the plague was controlled and was brought to non-existence all over Europe. Today, it only exists in parts of Asia, Africa and South America, but mostly among animals as opposed to being a predominantly human disease. Despite the introduction of a vaccination, the plague is still by no means an extinct disease. It still looms in small numbers across Asia and Africa, and while the majority of cases are animal related, infections of humans are still being reported to this day. Madagascar is a particular hotspot for such cases, and there is a much more worrying underlying problem. Like all diseases that can be treated with antibiotics, there is a risk of antibiotics becoming ineffective and spawning a resistant version of the Y. pestis bacteria. This isn't just a future threat either, superbug plague cases have already been recorded in Madagascar, with the last one as recently as 2017. It, like most superbugs, will likely not be much of a problem for a fair amount of time, but with the rise of bacteria resistant diseases, the amount of people now living in poverty in urban areas globally, and the historic destruction the plague has caused, it is more than understandable that some may be a bit concerned. If a major outbreak occurred in Africa, India or South America, which was resistant to antibiotics, then huge urban areas could be hit with the same ferocious pace at which the plague ripped through the lands before. To give you a sense of just how dangerous that is, the plague's total body count across all of Europe in the 1300s was around 50 to 70 million. China has multiple cities with over 20 million inhabitants, and Sao Paulo in Brazil also clocks in at over 20 million residents too. If these areas were to be struck, the plague would transmit and kill much faster, especially in its antibiotic resistant state. It's a chilling perspective of the dangers of antibiotic misuse, so if you have a cold, or something that can be easily treated with rest, do not take antibiotics, and furthermore, if you are taking antibiotics, finish your goddamn prescription, even if you feel fine beforehand. Humanity has made some incredible breakthroughs as a species. We've put people on the moon, we've launched interstellar probes, and we've created electrical intelligence. And yet, disease is always something we have been one step behind. No matter how far we've come, 
we've almost always been playing catch up when it comes to treating new diseases, simply because there could be something new that is poorly understood hiding out there somewhere, perhaps in the dry plains of Central Asia or in the dense jungles of the Congo. We never know when, where or what the next big epidemic is going to be and the plague epitomises this, a disease that killed off half the world's population in the 1300s and continued to rip apart entire continents for hundreds of years after. It is an unsettling reminder of just how fragile life truly is. Humanity genuinely risks extinction at the time, and if the plague ever returns in its full force, the human cost will be nothing short of catastrophic.